Thank you, Jonathan. Well, good morning again. Welcome to the house of the Lord. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> this morning. Might be a difficult one for me. Hold on. It's ironic. <clears throat> wow. It's ironic that I can't speak when I think about the title of my message. Instructions for a healthy body. Perhaps I should take my own advice. The instructions aren't for your physical body, though. We are talking about the body of Christ. What the Lord has purchased and what we each individually get to be a part of. You know, God, He wants His body to be united and to love each other. Because His body, His people, are a reflection of Him. The Bible says that God is love. It's one of the reasons why I thought it was fitting to keep this up here. But yet it's interesting because we have misconceptions about what love looks like. And sometimes in order to love, you must hate. To love that which is good means that you must hate that which is evil. The Bible doesn't say that God is loving. It says that He is love. <clears throat> yes, He is merciful and kind. But rather, His nature is love. Everything that God does must of necessity flow through love. But again, if we have a distorted understanding of what love is, we might come to think that it's all butterflies and rainbows. But God's love is manifested even by the things that he hates. And one of the things that he hates was already referenced this morning by Jonathan. The plague of our own heart. The sin that dwells within us. The things that bring division in the body of Christ. Pride and arrogance. These are things that the Bible says the Lord hates. Self-seeking and selfishness. <clears throat> when he was warning the children of Israel of impending destruction because of their sins, the prophet Amos instructed them in chapter 4, verse 14. Sorry, in verse 15, he said, Hate the evil and love the good. In order to be faithful to God, they had to hate that which was evil. But what's most important for us as individuals is not to always be on the lookout for evil out there, but to know the plague of your own heart. To know where evil resides in you. A lot of times... In, in, in popular Christianity today, you're going to be instructed about all of the good things about you. That you are amazing. And you are so strong. And you are so smart. And now there is an element of truth in that, which is what makes it so deceptive. Yes, you have been made in the image of God. Yes, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And yes, you have incredible value before the creator of the universe. But every person must understand the plague of his own heart. If you don't understand that, then you're not going to understand all of the instructions that the scriptures give us in terms of how we are to interact with each other. You'll wonder, why is the Bible keep repeating these things over and over and over? 
You know, you think about Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Chapter, or chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. If we were good, naturally, if there was no plague in our heart, these sorts of instructions would be needless. Why would God be telling us, humble yourself, unless in each of our hearts there was a danger of pride? Why would God be telling us to exalt others better than ourselves unless our natural tendency is to exalt ourselves above others? You see, the Lord knows your heart. And it's important that we know our heart. In the church of Jesus Christ, there must be, get this, this is God's vision for a church. There must be no strife. There must be no selfish vanity. There must be people who are esteeming others better than themselves. And there must be people who are caring for one another's burdens. Now, by God's grace, I believe that in this body, we have fulfilled a lot of these things. But we would be foolish to think that we don't have room to improve. One of the worst things we can do is think we've arrived. The Bible even calls out those who refuse these instructions. Can you imagine for a moment... That for 2,000 years, your name is synonymous with arrogance and strife in a church? That's kind of a bad claim to fame. And yet, the Apostle John, who is the Apostle of love, wrote in 3 John chapter, or verse 9, he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Therefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good." He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Can you imagine? Diotrephes, for all of time, is going to be known as the guy that stood against the Apostle John. He is now the one that we always will remember as a problem. God takes this seriously. Now, quite simply stated... Those who sow discord in a church. People who sow discord in a church, who bring division, who exalt themselves above others, and who create factions and cliques within the body of Christ, who gossip and slander and try to distort the truth. These people simply do not know God. It's a strong statement, but it is the one made by the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love. In Proverbs chapter 6, in verses 16 to 19, on the list of things that the Bible says the Lord hates, number 7, last but not least, he that soweth discord among brethren. The person who creates division in the body. I remember hearing of a young pastor who was called to serve in a church. Soon after he started, the gossip began to fly. Accusations began to circulate about his character, about his intentions. He just wants to be a leader of a huge church, they said. He's just filled with pride and arrogance and envy. Those people who created the faction and created the division ultimately got that pastor kicked out of the church. 
they sowed enough division within the church that the pastor was no longer welcome. None of those people actually talked to the pastor. None of them actually sought to know what his heart was like. And as the years have gone by, in that church, leaders are chewed up and spit out. There is a cancer in that church. And it is someone or a group of people who sow discord among the brethren. And if that church doesn't address it, it will never flourish. God gives us instructions on how to be healthy. But we must know the plague of our own heart. We must know our own intentions and where I could be a problem. Where I might be the one who's not seeking after the will of God but seeking after my own will. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Colossians chapter 3 as we continue. And if you would be so kind as to stand with me as we read Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And it reads, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, Meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Heavenly Father, again we come before you this morning. And Lord, I thank you for the scripture that was read this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the warnings that you give us, that we must know the plague of our own heart. I thank you, Father, for the clear instructions you have given us for a healthy body. And I pray, Lord, that you would move in each of our hearts as we individually see how we can help this body become healthier and healthier stronger and stronger. Father, we pray that your name would be glorified and that Jesus would be exalted. God, we thank you for all that you have done for us and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you were here last week, you'll recognize I went back a little bit too far in terms of what I want to preach on today. But this all flows together and so you kind of have to Merge them. Last week we talked about put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. We talked about getting dressed in the body of Christ. And that Christians ought not be naked. In the old, we were told to put off the old man. To put off sin. To get rid of that coat of selfishness and perversion and sin that just so easily envelops us and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to put on holiness and love and long-suffering and meekness. These, again, we talked about this last, last week, these are relational attributes. These are things that deal with how you deal with other people. The Bible doesn't say put on diligence. Oh, we're called to be diligent. 
But in the context of the Colossians, he's giving instruction on how you can be a healthy body. He didn't say that you need to work hard and provide for your family. Although that is important and that is instructed elsewhere. The context that we're looking at is the body of Christ and how we interrelate with each other. Forbearing one another. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. We talked about how Jesus forgives. He pursues you for forgiveness. He offers forgiveness before you even ask. He, uh, he wants you to be restored. This is relational. This is how we deal with each other. We talked about the difference between forbearance and forgiveness. You want more instruction on that? Go back, watch last week. It's on YouTube. You're good. Let's go on. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. <clears throat> it's interesting when we, we read this verse and when we think about letting the peace of God rule in our hearts, very often our minds tend to go towards the feeling of peace. As in, I should have peace. That, that a fruit of the Spirit is peace in my own soul. I don't have turmoil in my own soul. And that is true. However, in the context of this chapter, we're talking about relational peace as well. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in the body. The body of Christ ought to be a place where there is peace. A place where there is Calm. A place that is safe. Last week I talked to a brother of mine in another town. Christian brother. My brother doesn't talk. But brother in Christ. And he said Monday was always the hardest day for him. See, because after being so discouraged on Sunday, he had to build himself up so they could go to church again next week. And I thought, there is something radically wrong with your church. If Sunday is the most discouraging day for you, something needs to be addressed. It is always my prayer that when we gather together as the saints of Christ, that we leave here stronger. That we leave here with the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. That when we worship God and we commune with God together as believers, that when we walk out these doors, we're just bubbling over with the love of God. And so I also want to encourage you. If Sunday morning is difficult for you and it leaves you discouraged, please let me know. Because that sort of thing needs to be addressed. Now, if it's discouraging because you love your sin and you want to live in it, sorry, can't help you there. We're going to hammer on that all day long. You got to be killing sin or sin's going to be killing you. You can also watch that on YouTube. But right now we want to talk about how this peace isn't exclusively an emotional feeling. Rather, it is the relational aspect of the body of Christ obeying the commands of Christ in their dealings with one another. How you deal with your brothers and sisters in Christ ought to produce peace. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. In the sister, sister epistle, say that five times fast, sister epistle to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes it this way, that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You're supposed to endeavor for that. That's something you're fighting for. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, chapter 4, verse 3. 
We are each individually called to take our place in the body of, in Christ, a body of Christ, endeavoring towards unity, peace, love, and service. Oh, and be thankful. I love, as I was reading this, it's just interesting how that last little tag on, it just seems almost like an afterthought. The Apostle Paul, he's probably dictating this letter. And he tells the guy to write this, he says, you know, which you're called in one body. And the man's writing. And I, I don't know, I just, I picture things. And I envision the Apostle Paul walking. And there's a bit of silence. Then he says, oh, and be thankful. Be thankful too. That's important. Write that down. It's almost just a little tag on, and yet it is incredibly important. And that's why it's written there. The Spirit of God thought it was vitally important to make sure that he added that. Be ye thankful. But what does this mean? Again, are we just like thankful for everything? Well, yes, you ought to be. In fact, the Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But it's not just about general thankfulness. Again, think about what we're talking about. We're talking about the relationship between the body of Christ. And so we're talking about thankfulness for you. My thankfulness for you. You want to have a healthy church, have a church where the people are thankful for each other. I was thinking about making a list and I was sitting there and as I was thinking about it this morning about the things that I'm thankful for in this body and I thought I should I would just start naming people and why I'm thankful for you and then I thought but if I miss somebody then they might be hurt so I'm just gonna say this morning that I am thankful for each and every one of you in a unique and special way. And if you want to ask me personally afterwards what I'm thankful for, I'll tell you. Because i got a list in here. But I don't want to risk hurting somebody. One thing I am going to mention I am thankful for, I love the young people sitting in the front. You have no idea what that means to a pastor. And for you guys, you've grown up, and this is just normal, you've always sat in the front. You go to most evangelical churches, the youth are as close to the back door as possible. Not ours. You guys just come right up front. And I like, too, how the boys are separate from the girls. That's important. <laughs> and you just did that on your own. Especially since my girls are sitting over there, boys. <laughs> I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the noise in this church. Reminds me of Dr. Deutscher years ago. We only had one child and she was a handful. I'm not going to name her. <laughs> she was little and full of energy. and We had our church camp out in Teen Time Ranch. and Dr. Deutscher, he came up and he began to share out of God's word. And, and my lovely daughter just wouldn't sit still on those wooden planks that they had for us to sit on. And so finally, I took her outside. I said, girl, you need to listen to me. And out we went. And I gave her a few corrections. And then I came back inside. And Dr. Deutscher says, you know what I love about your church? The children. He said, if your children are being noisy, leave it be. I love the sound of children. Well, that I feel foolish. But as I've grown older, and as I've had to sit through having four children at small ages and growing up, I realize the incredible blessing it is to have a church with these little people. I think a lot of people don't, especially for us, it's one of those things where we have such an incredible blessing, we don't even know what kind of a blessing we have. If you go to most evangelical churches out in the world, most of the people are older. There's not a lot of young families, not a lot of young people. So that's another thing that I'm thankful for. The children. Now, yes, you need to learn how to sit still, but we have grace for you, and we have mercy for you, 
and we love you, and we're glad that you're here. This is a vital ingredient to peace in the body. It's the peace of God ruling in our hearts, being thankful for each member. Verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Often when we think about studying the Bible, we think about studying for our own benefit. I want to know the Bible so that I can know the will of God for my life. I want to know the Bible because I want to have a closer relationship with Jesus. I want to know the Bible so that I can defend myself against the wiles of the devil. And all of those things are true. The Bible even says in Psalm 119 verse 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It's important for you as an individual to know the word of God. This is your defense against error. This is your defense against deception. It's knowing what God says. However, we see here that the context of God's word dwelling in us isn't just for us. The reason it's important that the Word of God dwells in me is so that I can take that Word of God and bless you. And it's no different for you. You need to know the Word of God, not just for yourself, but for one another. This is the command of Scripture. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. We are to be growing in our faith but for the benefit of everybody, not just me. Not my benefit alone, but for yours as well. There is no such thing as a solo Christian. There is no such thing as a Christian on an island. Except for the Apostle John, they exiled him there, but that's another story. As Christians, we live in community. We are called the body of Christ. And as such, when the word of Christ dwells within us, it is so that we can benefit and bless the people around us. Paul told the young church leader, Timothy, he said, Neglect not the gift of God that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. So you imagine, the, they, they, they found this young man named Timothy. He was a faithful young man. He had a good reputation in the Christian community. And they had started a church in this community. And they said, Tim, you're going to be the leader. You're going to be the pastor. And so all of the elders came out. And I don't know how they did it. The way we do it is we have the elder, the pastor, he kneels. And all of the elders lay their hands on him and they pray for him. And so Timothy was endued with a gift from God. But that gift wasn't for him. He says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Timothy, why do, you want to prof why do you want to prosper in your faith? Timothy, why do you want to be strong in Christ? For others so that they can see what God can do with a person who's solely given over to Jesus Christ. You want to show the world what a sold-out Christian looks like, what it looks like to be on fire for Christ. And you know what happens when you put flame next to flame? They burn hotter. This is why we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly with all wisdom. Timothy's relationship with God and his obedience to God were commands to be obeyed for the profit of everyone. That they too would see the profit of serving Jesus. Didn't Jesus say, let your light so shine before men? To not hide your candle under a bushel, but put it on a candlestick so that it shines brighter? We are called to provoke unto love and to good works. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, but don't be selfish with it. It's not just for you. 
He continues. He says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We as a body, and not just the pastor, but as the body are to teach each other. We are to impart instruction. This starts first in your home. Husbands to your wife. You are to be discipling your wife. You are to be encouraging your wife. You are to be cherishing your wife. You are to be showering her with the word of God and that she would know what God says. And from there, we goes to your children. And from there to your friends as you encourage one another. You see this phrase in the Bible, one another. Again, there's no such thing as a solo Christian. We are here for one another. The only way that you can obey Scripture is if you give yourself to serving one another. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We see this communal nature of the church. We see this Psalms and hymns. Memorized, but not just for me, but for you. I was thinking this morning, I, I messaged Henry. Uh, we prayed for his son, Fernando. And he sent me a short clip of a song that he was singing. Anybody who knows Henry knows that if you want to talk to Henry, he's going to sing back. And one of the things that I've always loved about Henry, when, we, when he first came here, I'll be fully transparent, I was a little skeptical, because nobody wants to sing that much. I thought it was kind of this weird act. I wasn't sure how, and I kind of watched him for a while, and all of a sudden I realized, this guy's the real deal. He actually believes what he says. And he's actually living out what he believes. He actually has, as is said, a song in his heart. And he will not keep it to himself. He sings for all to hear. He doesn't have the most beautiful voice. He doesn't sing in the most eloquent manner. But I sat there at my island this morning and I had my phone on and I was just listening to him sing. And it brought me into the words of the song that he was singing. And I sat there for two minutes and me and Henry worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ together. It was the most fascinating thing. And how fitting that it would be this morning when I'm talking about singing to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. They are for our teaching and admonition. We see in this verse, too, the importance of music in the church. The importance of lifting up your voices to sing. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Somehow, in God's wisdom, we find music easier to remember than just words. Isn't that interesting? You, the other day, I was flipping through channels on the radio, and I heard a song that I hadn't heard probably since the early 2000s. And I sang along all the way through. And then I shut it off because it's a terrible song. I'm like, you should be singing this. Okay, enough of that. But I had, how, how is that even possible? Because this is God's design. Singing is a vital component, and it's not just to encourage your heart, but it must be theologically sound. It's songs that are based on the truth of God's Word. Songs that are based on the Scripture. And sometimes you can just read and sing the Scriptures. We see the nature of a biblical song. It's a song that is melody-driven. 
the melody of a song is the thing that you whistle. That's the melody. And all of you know the song, mostly. It's songs that will edify and build up the body. And it's songs that are theologically sound. I heard one guy describe it this way. It's songs that are sung about God and songs that are sung to God. Much of modern contemporary worship is songs about me and how God makes me feel. That's not a theologically sound song. And I would argue that maybe it goes in file 13. Maybe we think through our songs don't accept compromised lyrics just because it sounds good. Just because we've always sung it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on everybody's toes here. This is a song that has bothered me for a long time. Now I'm not going to tell you that it's a sin for you to sing it. But I am going to tell you to always think about Scripture. Scripture. When you are singing a song about God, the question is, is this biblically accurate? Because if you want to encourage each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, they have to be based on the truth. Otherwise, you can be led into deception. Music is one of the ways that the devil loves to deceive people. Above all powers, accurate. Above all things, accurate. Above all nature and all created things? Accurate. Above all wisdom and all the ways of man? Accurate. You were here before the world began? Accurate. And you thought of me above all? That's not in here. That is not in here. It's not to say that he didn't think of us. Obviously, he went to the cross and he bore our sin. That's what the Bible says. But the way the song is structured is it makes me the central focus. You are all of these things. You're all of these things. You're all of these things. And you thought of me above everything else. Is that actually what the Bible says? Because the Bible doesn't say that. When Jesus was praying to not go to the cross, he didn't say, but Lord, I want to save Billy. He said, thy will be done. And he went to the cross in submission to his father to fulfill his will. Not so that I could 2,000 years later make it all about me. See, I've offended everyone. I'm not saying that it's a terrible song because there is a lot of truth in it. But what I'm asking is that you think through your songs with scripture. That you ask yourself, what? What am I singing? And does it line up with the word of God? Don't accept compromised lyrics just because it sounds good. And also be diligent to use songs that come from safe sources. This is also vitally important, especially in this day and age when you've got YouTube and Spotify and you have access to a wide range of music. As a pastor, I would not be doing my job if I didn't, at the very least, warn you of the dangers of contemporary Christian music. You know, when I was first saved, I came out of a conservative background, and I thought that everything that had the name Christian was truly Christian. I thought that if it says Christian, then it obviously is. And I took Christianity, and I just took this big lump, and I just was like, ooh, all of this is so wonderful. And then I started to read my Bible, and I started to compare, and I realized, whoa, there's things here that don't line up. Music is powerful. God created it that way. But the devil knows that it's powerful too. And one of the ways that he's going to use music is he's going to build a bridge to ungodly sources through music. He's going to take conservative churches, people who believe in the Word of God, and he's going to get them to listen to music from sources and people who don't. People who twist the word of God. And people who compromise the word of God. 
And you would never, ever attend that church. But you'll listen to their music. You would never sit under their preaching, but you'll listen to the music. And it builds a bridge. And you might not get caught in it, but your kids will. The next generation won't be as strong to stop against that tide. Think about your favorite Christian band and ask where they're coming from. Here's a general rule. If your favorite Christian band is up for a Grammy, you may want to rethink your allegiance. Did anybody catch the Grammys this year? I hope not. Most of you didn't, and I'm glad. But the Grammys were one of the most demonic displays that has ever graced primetime television, and that's not an exaggeration. And you're thinking, are you serious? There's a lot of bad things that have been on TV. Yeah, it was worse. It was demonic. It was literally, not figuratively, it was literally Satan worship. It was all red. The main singer had a hat on with horns, and they bowed and praised him in this demonic act. Shortly after that, they call up a Christian man to accept their Grammy. What fellowship has light with darkness? It has none. And then there's churches that are affiliated with the NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. Churches who are not preaching the counsel of God, but are distorting the scriptures and exalting experience. Every single one of them has their own band. Why? To draw in the young people. To draw the young people away from the word of God and into their influence. Bethel music, Jesus culture, Hillsong. All of them come from compromised churches. Every last one. Now what they do, because they're not stupid, is they throw enough theologically sound songs in. They throw a little sugar in with the poison because it makes it easier to eat. But you need to ask yourself, is this a bridge that I want to build? Is this a connection that the Spirit of God wants me to have? Or is God calling me to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord? If there are churches preaching false doctrine and I would never listen to the pastor, do I want to listen to his worship band? Do we not think that that worship band is obviously completely influenced by what he says? We want to sing to each other in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. This isn't to say that we can't write new songs. This isn't to say that we can't have contemporary music. But we must be very vigilant. Because the music must be based on the truth of God's word. It must be grounded in what the Lord has said. And must not give place to the devil. Finally, he says in verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father. By him. You see, all too many times, especially when it comes to music, but, but even in other things, cultural things, the question that we'll often ask ourselves is, yeah, well, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with that thing? There's nothing wrong with that thing. And for me, I just simply flip it around and I ask, can you do this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you sing a song that's theologically warped unto your Lord? Can you sing a song that distorts the truth unto Jesus? You can. See, we know that's true, but it's uncomfortable because that means I have to truly examine my heart. I have to know the plague of my own heart. That means that I can't just do whatever I want to do. That means that everything I do has to come under the lordship of my sovereign king. Including the movies I watch. The things I listen to. 
the sermons I listen to, the clothes I wear, the places I go, the jobs I take, everything falls under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It says, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to do His will. You want to do what He calls you to do. You don't want to sin. And so a very simple question to ask yourself, when you sit down and you want to watch a movie, Would I want to watch this with Jesus sitting right beside me? Because guess what? He is. He's with you every step of the way. Would I want to listen to this music with Jesus here with me? You know, back in the 90s, there was this thing that kind of caught on. It was the what would Jesus do thing. And people got bracelets and everything with WWJD. And it was a little bit cheesy. And it kind of got distorted. But there is an element of truth in it. And it comes from this verse. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, when you're finished doing that thing that you want to do, can you take the name of Jesus and stamp it and say, this was for you, Jesus. This was for you. This was in your name. This was for your glory. This was for the exaltation of Christ. Can you do it? Each of us has to wrestle with what this looks like in my life. Does that mean that any kind of entertainment is wrong? No, the Bible doesn't say that. But it does say, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace. God, we thank you for your goodness, your love. But God, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word which directs our path. Father, we thank you that you want what is best for us. That when you give us instructions and when you give us Barriers even in our life. Places where we should not go. Things that we should not see or hear. It is not for our punishment, but Father, for our blessing. And we thank you, God, for your incredible love to us. Lord, I pray that these words would do a work in our hearts for each and every one of us. Father, that we would be diligent that we would realize that we have a very real enemy who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but we also have a very real enemy within our own hearts. May we recognize the plague of our own heart. May we see, Lord, when pride comes up and help us, Father, to renounce sin in all of its forms. And may our lives shine bright for your glory and for your praise that your name would be exalted because we love you, Lord Jesus. Amen.